Okay. Should be good now. Um, next was k over s squared plus k squared. And that was sine of kt. The inverse of s over s squared plus k squared was cosine kt. And hyperbolic sine and cosine come from the inverse transform of k over s squared minus k squared. I don't know why I wrote the order backwards, but we'll go with it. Okay, so these are the six functions that, or I'm sorry, these are the five functions that you need to be very familiar with. These two we're not going to see too often. We'll have ways of uh, finding their transforms without having to worry about hyperbolic sines and cosines. Um, just like before, not only does the Laplace transform possess linearity, so does its inverse. So all those neat things we did before, to make life a little easier, we can do with the inverse transform. Okay? So we're just going to do a few examples and then wrap it up with a quick little theorem. Let's say I want to find the Laplace transform of 1 over s to the fifth. Okay. Because of the s to the fifth, this tells us that our function should look something like this. We really don't want a 1 up here. What do we wish we had instead of 1? We wish it was a 4 factorial, so we're going to make it a 4 factorial. But in order to do that, exactly. So it's not hard. If it doesn't look exactly like the right form, make it the right form and then adjust it as necessary. So this is the same as 1 over 24. And then what is the inverse transform of 4 factorial s to the fifth? What is it? t to the fourth, good. Okay. Why don't you guys try this one real quick? Inverse transform of 1 over s squared plus 64. So take 20 seconds. See if you can figure it out. Okay, instead of the 1, what do we really wish it were? 8. Because of the 64, right? We'd want that to be 8 square, uh, 8 to be in the numerator, so then we just put a 1 8 out in front. So now we have 1 8, and then what's the inverse transform of 8 over s squared plus 64? Sine 8t. 
pretty easy. Okay. Let's say we have, whoops, I want this to be S. 2S plus 11 over S squared plus 5. Probably a good idea to use the linearity property, split it up first. So this is the same as 2s over s squared plus 5 plus the inverse transform of 11 over s squared plus 5. The only thing that's off about this one is what? The 2. So let's pull it out. And then all we have is s over s squared plus 5. And that's exactly the inverse transform for cosine of root 5 times t. Good. Plus. Okay, we don't have an S in the numerator, so this has to be sine, right? This will be sine of root 5t, meaning that we need to divide by root 5 and pull the 11 out. Does this kind of make sense? Okay. Uh, let's try this one. The inverse transform of 2s squared plus 10s minus 4 over s cubed minus 4s. All right, so we run into kind of an issue here. Um, why don't we try to clean up the fraction that's on the inside? Should we leave this as s cubed minus 4s? Let's take, yeah, let's factor. Let's take out an s, which gives us s squared minus 4 which is the same as s minus 2, s plus 2. We do not have an inverse transform for anything that looks like this, right? Any ideas? What's that? If you divide a 2 there, then you have to divide a 2 in here, right? Will that help us, though? s squared plus 5s minus 2? I don't think it'll help us factor anymore. Partial fractions will be the way to go. Okay? What's the decomposition? Constant over s plus good. And I, I hope you see the benefit. We know what the inverse transform of over s looks like. We know what this is going to look like. We know what that's going to look like. We just have to find what constants to use. Okay, so let's do the decomposition real quick. Um, 
we have 2s squared plus 10s minus 4. That's going to equal a times the other two denominators, so s squared minus 4 plus b, s times s plus 2, so s squared plus 2s, oops, plus c times s squared minus 2s. <coughs> So then from here, if I look at all the s squared terms, what equation should I have? We have a, b, and c, and that has to add up to how many? 2. Look for the s terms. We have 2b and minus 2c, and that should give us a total of 10 s's. And now all our constants, actually it's just minus 4a, and that has to be minus 4. So this isn't too bad. a is 1. If a is 1, then this gives us a slightly easier system b plus c has to equal 1 after you plug in 1 and subtract, right? And then 2b minus 2c equals 10. We can double and add. That'll cancel out the c's. Double the first, add them up. We get 4b. has to equal 12, so b is 3, which then makes c negative 2. Okay, so going back to our original problem, we are essentially taking the inverse transform of a over s, so that's just 1 over s, plus b, so 3 over s minus 2, minus 2 over s plus 2. Okay, so all we've done is take this, transform the function that's on the inside, made it look a little nicer to work with, and now we can just take the transform of each of those. So what's the transform of 1 over s? The inverse transform of 1 over s. 1 plus, this is just a constant. Whenever we have 1 over s minus or plus, that's e to the whatever this number is, right? Minus 2, so 2t. Two minus 2, e to the negative 2t. Okay. Are we good with partial fractions? Because they're going to happen often. I want to make sure. I know we talked about those a while back, but everybody should be comfortable with that. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and finish with a theorem. The behavior of f of s as s approaches infinity. I know we don't have all the transforms in the world, but look at 1 over s, n factorial over s to the n plus 1, 1 over s minus a, all the functions on the inside. As s goes to infinity, what happens to those? 
they get smaller and smaller. So as s goes to infinity, f of s is going to go to zero. So then we'll, what we'll say is that the limit as s approaches infinity of the inverse, I'm sorry, the transform of f of t is going to equal zero, which we're not going to prove because I think intuitively looking at all the transforms you see makes sense. Okay, which actually helps us now. Okay, so here's an application of the theorem. Our f1 of s equal to s squared or let's say f2 equal to s over s plus 1 Laplace transforms. In other words, should we bother trying to find an inverse transform for this? Answer is no, and why not? What's that? Right. Okay, the limits as s goes to infinity for both of these don't equal zero. Okay, so because of that, so since f1 and f2 don't approach zero as s goes to infinity, we know that we're not going to waste our time and try to take the inverse transform of those. They don't exist. And yes, if you're wondering why my fingernail is so sparkly, I had a cousin over on Sunday, and I've yet to find the nail polish remover. So, <laughs> someday, hopefully soon. <laughs> anyway. That's it today. Questions? Since since F one and F two don't sorry, approach zero. Yep, that's what we meant to say. Since they don't approach zero as s goes to infinity, that's, that's why we know that we're not going to have an inverse transform to, to find. Okay. Okay. So 7.2 should be done for tomorrow.